and this. Okay, here we go, gang. The date today is the 9th, my mom's birthday. Already wished her a happy birthday because I'm that kind of son. And guys, let me explain to you what we're going to do today. But guys, understand we are going to get started whether you're ready or not. So join me. So guys, what we're going to do today is we are going to take a lot of the things that you either did or did not demonstrate a mastery of on the previous test. And we're going to bring these things together. And we are going to actually start asking and answering some really interesting questions. So guys, this is sort of the beginning of the time period where all these Lewis dot structures that you were drawing actually are more than just, oh, look, I can draw dots on a paper. So guys, specifically, Specifically, these are the things that you need to be able to bring forward from the last unit. So first of all, drawing Lewis dot structures, big part of the test. Second of all, molecular geometries. You've got to have in your head an idea of what tetrahedral looks like. What does trigonal pyramid look like? What does bent look like? What does straight look like? What does trigonal planar look like? What does linear look like? Guys, it's not enough to just be able to draw these. You've got to be able to picture what they look like in your mind. And hopefully you can do that as a result of the lab and other things that we've done. Then guys, the other thing that we need to bring forward is the two types of covalent bonds that exist. It was on the test, and I've looked at your scores on the multiple choice, and from your scores, a lot of you don't understand this. So guys, we are going to go back and we are going to talk about polar covalent bonding and non-polar covalent bonding. And then guys, we're gonna bring all of that together and we're gonna talk about molecular polarities. It's a relatively short day. You'll have time to work on your homework. But guys, the big idea is this, and this is why I love teaching this unit, because this gets really practical. So you guys, today, well, not today, but by the end of this unit, we're going to be able to answer some pretty interesting questions. Like, for example, this. Why does sugar dissolve in water? You guys all understand that, right? Sugar dissolves in water. But did you know that sugar does not dissolve in gasoline? If you dump sugar into gasoline, it doesn't dissolve. See, sugar into water makes sense because you guys have all cooked and done things in the kitchen. But guys, this sounds kind of stupid, right? Sugar into gasoline, who on earth would do that? You do, of course, know who does this, right? Dumping sugar into gasoline. Environmental terrorists. You guys heard of the monkey wrench gang? You guys heard of monkey wrenching? Do you get out at all? No, you've heard of tree huggers. Okay, and you understand that tree hugger is not a derogatory term for people that like the environment. It's actually a verb. It is a thing. You understand that tree huggers got their names because there are people in the Pacific Northwest that actually chain themselves to trees. They wrap their bodies, their arms around trees. They handcuff one another to trees, and they are literally standing there sometimes for days hugging trees. You didn't know this. Yeah, so why are these people hugging trees? So people won't knock them down. They're, when they log in the Pacific Northwest, they don't use chainsaws, they use these bulldozers and these really, they're really cool. They're these huge bulldozer-like things that have these jaws that grab a hold of the tree and then these two saws come in and go and they cut the tree and then the jaws have a hold of the tree and then they load it onto, well, they limit and then they load it on. So these people are literally hugging trees, hoping that the people running these tools will not kill them in an effort to get the tree down. You didn't? All right. Anyway, so these people are who are called environmental terrorists. It began actually in Utah. Did you guys know that? That environmental terrorism started in Utah at the hands of a guy named Edward Abbey. Have you heard of Ed Abbey? 
Oh, guys. Okay. So Ed Abbey was actually a park ranger down in Arches National Park back in the 60s. This was back when the road into Arches wasn't even paved. And Ed Abbey, who's out there living in Arches, it was very remote at the time, wrote a book called The Monkey Wrench Gang. And this book was all, it was a fictitious story about a bunch of monkey wrenchers who were out there doing terrorist things to try to fight for the environment. And, and people got a hold of this and they actually turned it into Greenpeace. You've heard of Greenpeace. Oh God. Okay, so, so one of the things that these people do is that, and again, it's called monkey wrenching, it's a verb. What these guys will do is they will actually go into the forest in the Pacific Northwest and in an effort to undermine the logging that goes on up there, they will actually dump sugar into the gasoline tanks of the bulldozers that they're using to, to knock the trees down. The sugar does not dissolve in the gasoline, it gets sucked through the carburetor and the fuel fuel injectors of these 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 trucks these dump trucks or whatever these bulldozers and it gets sucked up into the engine and it burns and when it burns inside the engine it actually seizes the engine and now you've got a bulldozer in the middle of nowhere that they can't start they also can't get in there to work on it and they just leave them there are actually bulldozers strewn throughout Washington state that are just crippled in the middle of nowhere because gasoline doesn't dissolve sugar how is that for a long answer to a short question? You get the, all right, so that was painful. All right, so guys, what about this? You all understand this, right? That sugar is a liquid or sugar is a solid, water is a liquid and carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature. The question is why? Or what about this one? Did you guys know this? That water expands when it freezes. Did you know that? Did you know that it's the only substance on earth that does? Guys, if our lakes were full of anything but water, they would freeze from the bottom up. If our oceans were made of anything but water, the icebergs would be on the bottom and the Titanic would have never sank. If our rain was made of anything but water, we wouldn't have potholes in our roads. You guys know how potholes form, right? crack in the road, the water gets down in the crack, you end up with a puddle of water underneath the surface of the road. When it freezes, what does it do? It expands. That breaks down the concrete, and then when the water thaws, everything collapses into the hole that was created by the expansion of the ice, and you end up with a pothole. What do you guys talk about in your homes? Anything of value? No? All right, just checking. All right, so <laughs> yeah, apparently you don't talk, that's healthy that you don't talk about potholes. But guys, what about this? Why do we salt our roads? You realize the answer is because people in Utah are sissies. In Wyoming, they don't put salt on the roads. They figure if you can't drive on ice, you don't belong in Wyoming. They do spread a little bit of sand around at the stop signs just to be careful, but they don't salt the roads in Wyoming. You guys know that? And actually, they really don't salt the roads in Wyoming. It's not because Wyoming drivers are burlier than Utah drivers. Why don't they salt the roads in Wyoming? You really don't know? It's too cold. See so guys, in Wyoming and Montana and other colder states, putting salt on the roads is actually largely ineffective because it won't melt the ice because it's still too cold. In Utah, yeah, we get ice, but it's still relatively warm, and so the salt is effective in terms of melting the ice. There you go. So, and it rusts our cars. So, never buy a used car from Utah. Find them from Wyoming where they haven't been exposed to salt water. You guys are learning so much. So, so guys, the bottom line is this. We are going to answer all of these questions by the end of the unit. The question is, how? What do they all have in common? And guys, what you're going to find out is that the answer to every single one of these questions comes back to the polarity of sugar, the polarity of water, the polarity of gasoline, the polarity of sugar, carbon dioxide, and water, and the polarity of, of salts. Guys, this all comes back to polarity. So in order to be able to answer the questions, we've got to be able to talk intelligently about polarity. So guys, that's what we're going to do today is we are going to introduce you to polarity. To do this, we need to go back and connect this to the previous unit. So guys, do this in your notes. Make these things about 
I don't know, four or five centimeters, two inches. Make your Lewis dot structures about two inches across and then write down the domain and molecular geometries and angles for these substances. Guys, this stuff is not going to go away. You're going to be drawing these structures a lot for the next unit and certainly throughout the year. So understand, gang, that if you didn't do well on the last page of the last test, that is not going to go away. You don't get to check that off your list and go, okay, I'm fine if I failed that test and I'm just going to let that go and no harm, no foul, and I can make it up later. Because you've got to know how to do these. So grab your periodic tables, draw these Lewis dot structures, and then identify their domain and molecular geometries and angles. By the way, guys, if you do choose to go to the library, I think they even have it in our library and get the book, The Monkey Wrench Gang. Um, I did not recommend it to you. The language in the book is horrible. I'm frankly surprised that we have it in our library. We have what? Oh, we do. See, that doesn't surprise me. I, I, I don't know why. I just looked that up online a couple weeks ago. Something significant happened with that. Like they just released it or something. In, is that what it, oh, that's what it was. They released it into Germany. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's scary for a whole lot of different reasons. Well, what's that? I do too. Yeah, my suspicion is that it's not as crazy as the Nazis made it out to be perhaps in the same way that the Quran is not as crazy as radical Islamists make it out to be. That would be an interesting paper. The radicalization of Muslims and the radicalization of Nazis. Wow. That gets the wheels spinning. The thing that's really funny is I'm looking down at the current AP test that I'm grading. Guess what they're doing? Lewis dot structures, names and angles. <laughs> so guys, let's do this. I suspect that some of you are close, but let me just give them to you. Check your answers as you go. CCL4 looks like that. You've got four chlorines radiating from the central carbon. Carbon dioxide, you know, has double-double bonds. Sounds like something you would order it in and out. Um, water is a hydrogen bonded to two oxygen, or I'm sorry, an oxygen bonded to two hydrogens with two non-bonding domains on the oxygen. Ammonia, NH3, that trigonal pyramid structure with one unbonded set of electrons. And then HCl, which is hydrochloric acid, looks like that. So guys, get them in there. We'll talk about the names and angles in a minute because those are important. And then guys, we're gonna move into the, the, the guts of the material, if you will. Actually, you know what, guys? I think I'm wrong. I think in our library, we don't have Monkey Wrench Gang. We have another book he wrote called Desert Solitaire, which also has a lot of bad language in it. But Are you all caught up? Not yet? So guys, remember, do, do include the names and angles with these. Um, that's going to be, in the words of our good friend, Mr. Ellingford, important. I'm convinced that Ellingford pronounces his own name wrong. He's way over Ellingford. No, how does he do it? It's even stronger than that, though. It's like, 
Yeah, that could be. And he doesn't have students, he has students. Yeah, he's, he's big into syllables. Do you ever feel like you just get smarter just being around Ellingford? He scares me. You guys all caught up? Okay, guys, let's, let's be caught up. Let's go over these. I'm not going to put these on the board because, frankly, they become clutter for me. Um, but you do need to have these on your paper. So when we look at the carbon in, in CCL4, it's called carbon tetrachloride, causes cancer. Um, anyway, when you look at, at, at CCL4, the carbon, the central atom, has four domains. Tetrahedral domain geometry. All four of those domains are bonding domains, so the molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. 109.5 degree angles, and that little fella looks like this, right? Ooh. You know what I just realized? I didn't collect the extra credit from you guys the day of the test. Speaking of 109.5 degree angles, would it be safe to assume that because none of you approached me on that, none of you did it? Okay. Sissies. Okay, then looking over at uh, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide looks like this. You've got double double bonds. And so we've got two domains on the carbon that makes its domain geometry linear. Because they're both bonding, the molecular geometry is also linear and that contains 180 degree angles. Well, a 180 degree angle. Then guys looking at water, four domains, tetrahedral domain geometry, but only two of those domains are bonding domains. So the molecule is bent and it looks like this. What's the angle? Less than 109.5. Then NH3, again, that's got four domains, tetrahedral, but only three are bonding. So that would be a trigonal pyramid that looks like this. And the angle is less than 109.5. And then finally, HCl, four domains on the chlorine domain geometry, or uh, tetrahedral domain geometry, but only one of those is a bonding domain. So the molecule is straight and the angle is undefined because two points don't define an angle, they define a line. You guys good? Okay. Yeah. Don't get rid of these. Not that you would, but guys, this is where we are going to end the day today. So before we move on, Anything you need to talk about there, gang? Names, angles, or structures? You're good? Yeah. All right. So guys, I would encourage you to not write this down. You already have this in your notes in the previous unit. This is a refresher. So guys, now we need to review what you know about covalent bonds. Now remember, covalent bonds are formed by two nonmetals. Now, what happens if those two nonmetals are the same nonmetal. What unique thing happens when two chlorines bond together, or two bromines, or two oxygens, or two nitrogens? What's unique about the way they share if you've got two of the same atoms? It's equal sharing. Guys, if you have two of the same atoms, those atoms have the same strength. If they have the same strength, they will share equally, and we call that nonpolar covalent bonding. So it plays out like this. I just stole this out of the notes from the previous time. So guys, when two hydrogens bond together, they both have the same electronegativity, in this case 2.2. As a result, that pair of electrons is centered. Remember, I actually drew the electrons and showed them right in the middle. Now I'm representing them as a cloud, but the idea is that cloud is symmetrical between the nuclei, the sharing is equal, and this is what we call nonpolar covalent bonding. Is that okay? Okay. Then we've got what's called polar covalent bonding. This is unequal sharing that occurs when you've got two nonmetals or hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is a metal, but it's freakishly strong and forms covalent bonds, but they aren't the same atoms. And as a result, guys, and this is the stuff you've got to get today. You don't need to write it down, but think through this with me. What happens is this. 
the electrons drift towards the stronger atom. You've seen that. I showed you those electrons drifting over towards the stronger atom when we talked about this initially. I'll show it to you again, but this creates what we call dipoles. Because I mentioned this to you in passing about two weeks ago. I said, don't worry about it until the next unit. That's today. So guys, what are dipoles? Dipoles, and this you do actually want to write down. You need to get this in your notes. Guys, dipoles are the partial charge on a bond that is created by unequal sharing. So guys, now the question becomes this. Which end of the dipole is going to be negative? And the answer is the stronger end of the bond because the stronger atom is going to pull the electrons towards it and the electrons are negative, so that would make it negative. So the more electronegative atom is the negative dipole and the less electronegative atom is the positive dipole. So guys, let me show you a model of this. Then we're going to apply these ideas to the atoms that we drew previously. First, you need to learn the rules about how to do that. And then guys, we're done for the day. We're almost done. And then you're gonna have the opportunity to fiddle with these as you work on your homework. So guys, this is the idea. I would encourage you not to draw it. For example, the, the covalent bond that exists inside of water. Of course, there's two of them. But looking at one of the oxygen-hydrogen bonds that exist in water, the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen. The oxygen is not strong enough to steal, but it is strong enough to pull the electron cloud closer to the oxygen. So guys, you can see by the shading in this cloud that the electrons are puddling towards the stronger oxygen. Now guys, what's the charge of this cloud? negative. It's full of electrons. So this cloud is negative. And what that means is that the oxygen end of this becomes the negative dipole. And then by contrast, the hydrogen end becomes the positive dipole. You're going to find out this is why sugar dissolves in water, but we'll talk more about it later. But guys, this is not the way we're going to label this. We are not going to write negative dipole here, and we're not going to write positive dipole here. Watch really close, guys. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to draw an arrow that represents the direction in which the electrons are drifting. So we're going to draw an arrow in that direction. So what does the arrow represent? the direction the electrons are moving. So that means this end is negative. Watch close. This end is negative. So what's this end? Positive. So watch what we're going to do. We're going to cross this end of the arrow showing, you see how it's sort of like a plus sign, showing that this end is positive and the negative electrons are moving in that direction. You get the idea? And why are they moving towards the oxygen? The oxygen's stronger. You guys all good with that? Okay, so now guys, we're going to take these ideas and we're going to apply them to molecules. You want to write this down. Here is the way to apply this stuff to molecules. You don't need to write this down. So here are our thoughts. Well, let's just do this. And then you can put it in your notes. Determining and representing molecular polarities. So guys, how are we going to do this? We now understand the bonds are polar. Now we need to talk about how that can make molecules polar. So this is the way to do it. First thing you're going to do is this. You're going to draw the Lewis dot structure. But guys, you are going to draw it as realistically as possible. How do you know what these realistically look like? You know the molecular geometries. How do you know the molecular geometries? From the last unit. So if something is trigonal planar, make it look trigonal planar. If something is bent, make it look bent. If something is linear, make it look linear. Draw these in such a way that they look as much as you can like the molecules really look. Sometimes, guys, that means you're going to have to erase them because you draw it and then you go, oh, this is really linear and I drew it kind of bent. 
So you erase it and redraw it. So draw them as realistically as possible. Then you're going to draw the polarity arrows for each one of the bonds. Now guys, you'll notice that I said that this is optional. I would suggest to you that this would only become optional once you've demonstrated an ability to yourself to do this successfully while drawing the arrows. So I would encourage you for at least the first four or five in your homework to draw the polarity arrows for the bonds. Then if you're finding that this comes naturally to you, you can stop drawing the polarity arrows for the bonds. By the time we get to the test after Christmas, I don't want to see them because they're not necessary. This is the part that is necessary. Determining if the molecule is polar. So how do we know if the molecule is polar? And the answer is this. We ask the question, does it have an imbalance in force? Now what would cause a molecule that have an imbalance in force? And the answer is, it's not symmetrical. Oh my gosh, that's why we had you identify symmetries in the lab that you just turned in. Because guys, if a molecule is symmetrical, it will be balanced and therefore not polar. If a molecule is not symmetrical, then it will be imbalanced and therefore polar. So guys, what this really comes down to is a question of symmetry. So it goes like this. If a molecule is balanced or symmetrical, it is nonpolar. And what you will do is you will simply label it as nonpolar. Now, if a molecule is imbalanced or non-symmetrical, and guys, I know this seems like a lot. When we start doing them, you'll get it. If a molecule is imbalanced or non-symmetrical, it's polar. And then what you will do is you will use one arrow to represent the overall polarity of the molecule. So this is what you're going to do today. Draw Lewis dot structures as realistically as possible. Then label the polarities of the bonds. Then ask yourself, is this molecule symmetrical? If it is symmetrical, you'll label it as nonpolar. You'll find out in a couple days those molecules tend to be gases, like carbon dioxide. Then what you'll do is if the molecule is not symmetrical, you will draw in an arrow indicating the overall polarity of the molecule. So guys, once you've got this written down, you're done with notes. We're going to go back up to the, how many did we draw? The five molecules that we drew previously. We are going to identify their polarities, and then I'm going to shut up and get out of your way and let you practice on these. And listen to Christmas music. Ho, ho, ho. You guys ready to go? Not yet? Oh, wait. So guys, the trick here is that you want to have these steps. You want to have these steps close by as you're going through this because it's nice to have the guidance from this. You guys all caught up? Yeah. All right. So guys, here we go. One at a time. Remember the steps. Draw the Lewis structure as realistically as possible. Find the polarity arrows for the bonds. Ask yourself it's, if it's symmetrical, go on from there. So step number one, draw the Lewis dot structure of the molecule, done. Step number two, praying that my board works. Come on, baby. Step number two is what? Polarity of the bonds. How do we know the polarity of the bonds? What do we need to know? Which one's stronger? How do we know which one's stronger? Electronegativities. Grab your periodic tables and look up the electronegativities of carbon and chlorine. Remember, they're on the back. I don't remember them, so help me out. Chlorine is what? 3.1. Carbon is 2.5. Which one's stronger? Chlorine. So guys, what that means is that every... Come on, baby. Every single one of these bonds, do this with me, every single one of those bonds is drifting towards the chlorine. 
literally the chlorines are stretching the carbon in all four directions. So all four of these bonds are polar towards the chlorine. Now here's the trick. Is the molecule polar? So now let's look at the molecule. Guys, join me up here. This is the last thing you do then. And here's the question. Is this symmetrical? This is symmetrical. Guys, if you hold it like this, watch. Same thing on both sides? Same thing on both sides? And same thing on both sides? Yeah, even though they don't line up, there is the same thing on both sides. This is symmetrical. So here's what that means. This pole and this pole and this pole and this pole all balance each other out. That means this molecule is not polar. Guess what it also means? It's a gas. We'll talk about that later. But guys, this molecule is nonpolar. So what we'll do is underneath this, we will write nonpolar because this molecule is nonpolar. So now you're asking yourself, wait a minute. Those bonds are polar. We drew the arrows. We know chlorine is stronger than carbon. If the bonds are polar. How can the molecule not be polar? What's the answer? How is it that this molecule is not polar if the bonds are polar? Why is that? Because it's not a new question. You know the answer. How is it this molecule is not polar? It's symmetrical. Guys, think about it this way. If we could get four of you to grab a hold of these chlorines and pull. So we got Mason going this way, and I don't know, Maddie and Cooper and I, and we just start pulling on these things. And if we could all pull with exactly the same strength, would the carbon move? Get the idea? All of the pulls cancel each other out. For those of you that have taken physics, remember vector sums? Guys, these are vector sums. If you understand that, the idea is that the vector sum in this molecule is zero. All of the poles cancel each other out, and this is a nonpolar molecule. Get the idea? What's that? You okay? Okay, questions? Okay, guys, let's do the next one. So the next molecule that we've got is CO2. Let's see how you do. Draw in the polarity arrows on your own. Draw in the polarity arrows for the bonds. And guys, understand the type of bond does not matter. Single, double, triple does not matter. Did you notice on this one you didn't even have to look up the electronegativities? They're in the same period. And what happens to electronegativity as we move left to right? Stronger. That means oxygen is stronger than carbon. So this bond is polar towards the oxygen. This bond is polar towards the oxygen. The oxygens are pulling the carbon apart. But guys, here's the question. Is this symmetrical? Yes. Because it's symmetrical, is it polar? No. This is a nonpolar molecule. Those two poles cancel each other out, and this is a nonpolar molecule. And guys, you would expect that to be true because what is carbon dioxide? A gas. That's why. This is a gas because it's nonpolar. We'll talk more about that in the coming days. Now, guys, let's do this. The next one that we're going to do is water. Guys, please don't do this. Just watch. Which is more electronegative, the oxygen or the hydrogen? The oxygen. So this is polar. Oh, I'm going to wish I hadn't done that. So, guys, this, I need to draw. Oh, look at that. All right. So this is polar towards the oxygen. This is polar towards the oxygen. Do they cancel each other out? So nonpolar, right? 
but wait a minute, water is a liquid. So if water is a liquid, we would expect that it's nonpolar. So what's the problem? What's wrong with what I just did? Water is not linear. Guys, this is not what water looks like. You know that. You wrote that down. What is the molecular geometry of water? It's bent. So if you draw water like this, it don't look bent. So you would have to erase it and redraw it so it looks bent. So if you drew it like I drew it, either erase it or cross it out and draw it bent. Guys, the bottom line is this. You can't be successful with this if you don't draw them in a way that looks like the molecule actually looks. Because watch what happens. Now let's draw in the polarity arrows. This bond is polar towards the oxygen and this bond is polar towards the oxygen. Now guys, take a peek. Is this molecule symmetrical? No. What hit the ground? Oh. HCl hit the ground. So guys, this molecule is not symmetrical, which means it's good heavens, which means it's polar. So here's what you're going to do. You ready? Think about it this way. Which direction is this bond moving? To the left. Which direction is this bond moving? Up. And what does to the left and up add up to? Well, this is going this way. This is going this way. If you add them up, it's going that way. Get the idea? So what you will do is you will draw in an overall arrow that represents the sum of the direction that the electrons are moving. So these are moving left, these are moving up. The overall movement is that direction. Now guys, here's the deal. In the end, that's all you need. If you don't need to draw in the arrows for the individual bonds, you don't need to. That's what I meant by it was optional. So if you can look at water and say oxygen, this one's going this way, this one's going this way, it's not symmetrical, so it's doing that, that's fine. I don't need to see the individual arrows, I just need the overall arrow for the whole molecule. So let's try NH3. So guys, NH3 we understand to be what shape? Trigonal pyramid. That'll work. Now, which is more electronegative, the nitrogen or the hydrogen? The nitrogen. So guys, let's try this without the individual arrows. What direction is this bond moving? Left. What direction is this bond moving? Up. What direction is this bond moving? To the right. Is it symmetrical? No, it looks like this. It's clearly not symmetrical. So what does left what does left and right and up add up to? It adds up to up. So the overall movement of the electrons is in that direction. So left and right and up all end up going up. That would be the polarity of the molecule. And again, if you can do this without drawing the individual bonds, knock yourself out. That's just fine. So now, guys, the last one, HCl. You okay? Oh, yeah, go. Guys, if you need to go for pictures, that's, go ahead. Um, so, guys, which is more electronegative, the hydrogen or the chlorine? Chlorine is more electronegative. Guys, there's no other bonds to worry about. The whole molecule is polar in that direction. Yeah. No, no, no. So if it's nonpolar, write nonpolar. If it's polar, draw the arrow. You guys good? Okay, so guys, here's the deal. Again, this is often the case. I make these look easy. You need practice. Um, on the homework that I gave you, there are 15 of them. And then following that, there are some questions for you to answer. Guys, I would encourage you to draw these Lewis dot structures from scratch. I know that a lot of them that we've done before, but we've never drawn them accurately three-dimensionally. Well, two-dimensionally, as accurately as you can. So do the homework, draw the Lewis dot structures, work on this together. I'd love to help. We've got half an hour. Go get them.